As Dr. Nelson just mentioned, we're honored to have Wendy Schmidt, one of our co-founders, close out our day. Many of you know Wendy. Uh, she's been a leader in philanthropy for two decades, not only co-founding Schmidt Futures, but also founding the 11th Hour Project, Schmidt Family Foundation, and the Schmidt Ocean Institute. Wendy has spent her life working for clean, renewable energy, healthy food systems, healthy oceans, and the protection of human rights. Please join me in welcoming Wendy Schmidt. Thank you so much, Barbara. And thank you all of you for being part of these conversations. It's so important that we take this time to share collective learning about this pandemic, to examine how we've responded around the world and discuss how to be better prepared in future for other global crises that will undoubtedly occur. I believe the network that you're forming here today will really matter. Now, what's happened since January of last year shouldn't surprise us now that the world has become so interconnected. Recognizing that, it's also important to notice how our many connections have come to mirror the interconnected natural world around us. To experience on so personal a level our common humanity and vulnerability to this virus should awaken us to other ongoing threats that can't be fixed with a vaccine, like rising sea levels, ocean acidification, plastic pollution, all of which challenge us to rethink where our species actually fits in on this planet. It turns out we're only human. And like it or not, in an evolutionary sense, we're still kind of on the menu. Now, we've just been talking about race and vulnerable populations and the inequalities brought to light during public health responses to the pandemic. I'm speaking to you today, not only as co-founder of Schmidt Futures, co-hosting this forum, but also in my role as president of the Schmidt Family Foundation, where over the past 15 years, we've worked hard to understand and address systemic inequality in today's energy and food systems, and to recognize how human rights issues are intrinsically connected to them. We don't see how transformational change to clean renewable energy, healthy food systems, to the elevation of human dignity can happen without addressing all these areas together as a system with consequences. So you could say we've been focusing on vulnerable communities, people lacking access all this time. And so I have a few observations. When I was in college, I majored in sociology and anthropology. It was commonly understood that these social sciences were soft sciences, not hard ones like chemistry and physics. They were considered relatively imprecise. Certainly social science knowledge is harder to quantify, especially when you're studying something qualitative. Take the notion of trust, for example. It's hard to measure with precision, but we can make relative comparisons. Also, you know it when you see it and can recognize how it contributes to a responsive and resilient society, where we can then observe the behaviors of bonding and bridging of social capital. In any case, here we are in the pandemic with plenty of good hard science at hand. We increasingly learn about the virus, its variants, like learning its code. We've even developed vaccines at record speed. So this isn't the problem. The hard science isn't the problem. The problem is people. As the summary of our comparative study observed, people are not merely biomedical entities. They're complex, sometimes irrational beings with a variety of feelings, beliefs, interests, rights, and ways of perceiving the world and their relationships with authority. This is the domain of social sciences as the problem we're talking about is fundamentally a social one and a problem with communications. So working to make sense of social dynamics and the characteristics of societies that respond effectively in a crisis is going to help us in the future. We can look to the present for this as the comparative study did, and we can also learn from the past. I think of our foundation work with indigenous peoples in the United States and all that we're learning from these societies that endured sustainably in every place in North America, some of them for more than 15,000 years facing every kind of conceivable condition, including centuries of attempts to destroy their ways of living. To survive, these communities needed the very three things the comparative study makes clear. First, community matters as the basis of our social contracts. Adaptability is key, especially during rapidly changing pandemic conditions. And resilience matters. 
Our study suggests it's more important than any pre-planned public health guidance. If you wanna watch how this plays out in Native American society today, I recommend a new highly praised documentary coming to Netflix next month. It's called Gather, and it explores the relationships between several native tribes throughout America and the natural resources that traditionally provided food sovereignty for them in sustainable systems designed around notions of balance and reciprocity. As we look forward with exciting developments in technology, genomics and medicine, new tools to be brought to the future wartime responses against pandemics, it's also important to observe what creates the social motivation and cohesion in societies, the foundation for adaptability, resilience and cooperation. Our experience at the foundation confirms the findings of the comparative study as we work around the world to empower local producers, distributors, community-based industries, primarily in food and agriculture and clean energy. Many of our grantees through this difficult year have found the networks they built to be exceptionally resilient and adaptable. Our connections and our trust with grantees has made it possible for us to be responsive and flexible in changing circumstances, shifting gears, if you will, but not needing to stop the car. On the eve of the pandemic, as everyone around the world was implored to wash their hands, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, we responded within days with a follow-up grant to extend a system of electric water pumps in the city of Goma, expanding access to clean water for an additional million residents. Upstream, connected to an electrical distribution grid built over the last five years, a system of micro hydro dams we helped to fund years ago has been supplying clean electric power to hundreds of thousands of villagers living around Virunga National Park, elevating the standard of living, hygiene, and economic opportunity, even as the negative societal impacts of COVID-19 in the North Kivu region outweigh those of Ebola. Access to clean, renewable energy ought to be thought of as a human right in the 21st century. It's one of the most critical and direct ways we can level the playing field and begin to address systemic inequities. In Philadelphia, New York, and Atlanta this year, an existing network of small farmers, ranchers, and growers already organized to distribute fresh, healthy food to people living in urban food deserts found extraordinary growth in demand for their products and support for their business model. The established bonds of trust, local distribution networks, and their very network itself enabled these small producers to step up together at a moment of crisis. Large ongoing government contracts for emergency food boxes suddenly appeared and food recipients accustomed to government distribution of prepackaged processed foods instead received boxes of fresh fruits vegetables, dairy products, baked goods, meats, and poultry. One of those recipients wrote to say that when he opened the first box, my thought, first thought was that someone wants me to live. The bar has been lifted, the gate is opened, and the model we funded is expanding and thriving, not only in the emergency, but in ongoing services for many kinds of institutions like schools and hospitals whose conventional supply chains were interrupted by the forces of the pandemic. Think about supply chains during this time and the fragility built into the kinds of piecework industries described by Tom Friedman in his 2005 book, The World is Flat. Lengthy international supply chains were designed for low cost and efficiency, not to be flexible, adaptable and resilient. In many ways, we've welcomed the opportunity provided by the pandemic for the world to stop for a moment and re-examine many assumptions that underlie the way we make things, the way we use natural resources and materials and design our systems of production and distribution. This can all shift to models that are regenerative, massively less wasteful, more resilient, more accessible and more inclusive. As philanthropists, we see one of our roles as helping to stimulate this conversation about the creation of a new circular economy around the world in which we value and endlessly reuse resources and to kickstart the investments needed to build such a world for the future. 
Many of the challenges to the public health response being discussed at this forum have been created by the systems belonging to the incumbent linear economy with its wasteful, destructive and exploitative design. I hope this well-qualified community will consider a working group on this topic of the circular economy, highlighting the power of networks and how we can redesign our economic, industrial and distribution systems for resilience over mere efficiency. As we consider today's predicament, where the world's nations were brought to their knees by a non-living viral particle too small to see, we're also challenged to ask what we need to understand about our place in the biosphere that supports human life with conditions that make it possible after four billion years of evolution for us to exist at all. Our philanthropy is working for a shift in perception and how human activity takes place in a world defined by interconnected living systems and how interdependent our fate is with the physical fate of our soil, atmospheric and ocean systems, each of which contains so many millions of life forms, our own species on earth is already dwarfed. I wish you all a productive conversation tomorrow as our work together continues and may this gathering begin to transform our understanding of the existential challenges we all face across the world, wherever we live. Wendy, thank you so much for those powerful worlds, especially for calling out the stronger connection we can build between the soft and hard sciences to make our world a better place for all people. That was a perfect way to close out the first day of the Futures Forum on preparedness. Thanks again to all of our speakers and panelists and to everyone who's tuned in from the, around the world. This was so incredible that we have decided to do it all again tomorrow. On day two, we will continue our conversation on trust at a panel on vaccine hesitancy. We will also take a critical look at science advising during COVID, talk about what the US and the world must do to move forward, and explore how scientific moonshots can revolutionize our fight against pandemics. We will also hear from more great leaders, including the Biden administration's nominee for Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy, and Schmidt Futures' other co-founder, Eric Schmidt. Please keep today's conversations going in our Slack workspace and meet us back here tomorrow to move forward this important work. Thank you.